Welcome to episode four of District of Conservation, friends. If you're new here, welcome. If you're a regular listener, I appreciate you guys checking us out. I think you'll enjoy our content at least to learn something new or something that is highly underreported if you're new here. So thank you for jumping in on the ride. I'm so excited to be introducing my very first guest for the series with none other than one of my favorite people in the hunting and firearm sphere, Mr. Cameron Edwards. You guys are going to learn more about Cam in this episode. But first, I want to do a little bit of some policy discussions before we jump into that interview. District of Conservation is sponsored by Real Camo Girl. It's a lifestyle brand focused on ladies who love the great outdoors. Through the website and social media platforms, they offer a safe space where the ladies can share their pictures, stories, wild game, and fish recipes, and news articles about conservation and hunting perspectives. I've served as a pro staffer of theirs since September 2016. It's been two years, and I've learned it's a network of women who love fishing, hunting, and the outdoors in general. Women come from all sorts of backgrounds, experience levels, and regions throughout the United States. It's a welcoming environment, and should you choose to be involved, especially if you're a lady, you will really enjoy it. So be sure to check out Real Camo Girl at www.realcamogirl.com and follow them across social media. I hope everyone had a great national hunting and fishing day this past Saturday. Instead of celebrating Fish Amnesty Day, which PETA wanted us to do, I think a lot of people chose to go with what has been in place since 1972 when President Nixon at the time put this motion into place and acknowledged this holiday for the first time. But I went down to Virginia Beach for the Raise Them Outdoors camp put on by my friend and awesome outdoors woman Erin Crooks. My father and I were the lead fishing instructors and we helped about 25 or so children of military servicemen land their first fish ever. One of the highlights of fishing with these newbies, new anglers, was that one little boy caught a trophy largemouth bass on like a kitty rod. It was a sight to behold. I was in disbelief at first, but he had the help of his father and then my dad helped kind of pull the fish in too. So it was cool to see that about eight different species of fish were caught by the kids with help from myself, my father, uh, my new friend Amelia Farrar, and a few others who were helping us with fishing. It was so cute just to see the kids landing the first catches, learning how to horseback ride, doing archery and that. And it was such a great event. I cannot highly recommend this camp enough. And I know Erin is going to be slowing down for a bit until the next year. So she, if you guys want to bring a camp to your state, talk to her now to book it early because she's going to be in demand for bringing camps all over the country. So I'll try to get Aaron on the podcast in the near future, but you should check out Raise Them Outdoors if you haven't already. But I wanted to talk briefly before jumping into the interview with Cam, uh, two very important updates that have happened. So as you guys know, I've been following this grizzly bear managed hunt very closely, but I'm unfortunately having to report through this podcast that the judge in question, Dana L. Christensen, who serves as the chief United States district court of the D- U.S. district court <laughs> for the district of Montana. That's a very lengthy title. Who was appointed by former president Obama has put a kibosh on this season's greater Yellowstone ecosystem, distinct population managed grizzly bear hunt, despite The contrary, pointing to the fact that this bear population in question has been restored to healthy levels. Again, I think this federal judge is playing politics. He fulfills the definition of what an activist judge is. And basically what he did with this motion that he put back in place yesterday, Monday, September 24th, he put back Endangered Species Act protections on the strain of grizzly bears despite the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and leading wildlife biologists in Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho suggesting that they're back to healthy levels. And in this 48-page document, he accused the Fish and Wildlife Service for be- of being negligent in their decision to delist this particular strain of grizzly bear and called the subsequent managed hunt, which only would have taken, if people were successful in harvesting, 24 grizzly bear tags, calling this whole practice objectionable. So here's what he said in this 48 page document. He said, although this order may have impacts throughout grizzly country and beyond, this case is not about the ethics of hunting and is not about solving human or livestock grizzly conflicts as a practical or philosophical matter. Judge Christensen wrote, really? Is that what he thinks? (laughs) This is, this is definitely rooted in politics and is anti-science. So he continued, Let me get back on track. He continued by saying this court's review constrained by the constitution and the laws enacted by Congress is limited to answering a yes or no question. Did the U S fish and wildlife service exceed its legal authority when it delisted the greater Yellowstone grizzly bear? I think they were within their right to delist it. They've been working on this for 40 years. 
goodness, across both types of administrations, Democrat and Republican. And he also continued by saying this, the service entirely failed to consider an important aspect of the problem, he wrote. He believes that Fish and Wildlife Service illegally negotiated away its obligation to apply the best available science in order to reach an accommodation with the states of Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana. The state wildlife agencies there in these three aforementioned states wanted this managed hunt to happen. They wrote about it on their respective websites. If you go to the Wyoming Fish and Game Department, it's listed there. They endorse this. The other two endorse it as well. So I don't know why he's issuing this resorting to politics. This is dangerous that these ESA protections, which admittedly did help restore this bear population over the course of decades, but when those protections have exceeded their limits or exceeded their purpose, they should be altered accordingly because you cannot lie about the status of a, of a particular species for political gain. Celebrating this and they're going to move on to other species, the black bear in New Jersey. They, they may move on to white-tailed deer that they may not like seeing people hunt, although they're plentiful and in fact at excessive levels. So this is a problem. Even if you don't go grizzly bear hunting, I personally don't see myself hunting grizzly bear in my lifetime, perhaps black bear because they're at <laughs> unmanageable levels here in Virginia, but you don't have to support grizzly bear hunting to see the potential slippery slope this will have if this managed hunt does not take place. And again, out of this third of a hunt, uh, 750 grizzly bears, because they determine that's the healthy level to decide whether or not from that pool you will have grizzly bear harvested. And obviously not every bear is going to be harvested. It's impossible from what I hear from friends who do bear hunting to successfully get a bear. If you're lucky, you'll get one. But again, this is such a small portion of the herd. It's not going to affect them or decimate them as a whole. I think we should place our trust in wildlife biologists over activist judges and also the anti-hunters and radical environmentalists who want to see hunting gone altogether. So this is disappointing, and I hope some legal front is going to be conducted, some legal challenge, and we'll report on that here if, if that transpires. And also, I wanted to discuss something more positively that happened recently was that the Department of Interior is using land and water conservation funds for... Uh, state outdoor recreation and conservation projects. So uh, I talked about the LWCF and how the House Natural Resources Committee passed an emergency bill to see this funding permanently restored. It has to then go before the full House of Representatives and then later the Senate to later be signed by President Trump if both houses agree to this. However, Secretary Zinke announced in a press release that $100 million dollars distributed from the Land and Water Conservation Fund to all 50 states, territories, and U.S., or excuse me, District of Conservation for state-identified recreational and conservation projects would be carried out. And if you recall from last week's episode, I discussed that these funds from this particular source are non-taxpayer dollars derived from the Outer Continental Shelf lease revenues and are awarded through matching federal grants administered by the National Park Service and... I think this will be interesting to see what happens and, and seeing those funds utilized. And again, I think the permanent reauthorization of the LWCF should happen and hopefully will happen given the version that they reached and, and agreed to because there were some concerns that local interests would not be represented. But that was interesting to see that come and be happening there. So now on to our interview portion with Cameron Edwards, guys. Enjoy and let me know what you think. I'm so excited to begin the interview portion of District of Conservation, and my first guest is none other than Cameron Edwards. You guys may follow him on social media. He is wonderful. We've known each other for the course of six years. I've been able to befriend Cam with his proximity to Northern Virginia. He's the host of NRA TV's Cam and Company. He's a farmer. He hosts a podcast called 40 Acre Fool. And he is such a great resource for anything related to firearms, hunting, and the like. So, Cam, I'm so excited you could join me as my first guest for the podcast series. Oh, Gabby, thank you so much. This is exciting, and congratulations. This is, thank I think, you. a fantastic idea, and I'm looking forward to listening. Thank you. No, and I'm glad you can be my <laughs> my first guest and, and kind of set the tone for what I hope to accomplish with the podcast. So, everyone knows you as a lover of guns, your baby farm animals. I mean, who couldn't resist baby farm animals if they follow you on social media? They see this. And your insight into the issues and kind of your interest in bringing on guests. So, you and I have often discussed a lot of stuff with me appearing on your show. 
But I want my guests to kind of see the reverse and see the man behind the mic <laughs> more so with Cam <laughs> Edwards because you have such a unique story and we've talked at length about your upbringing a little bit, but talk a little bit about how you got interested in hunting, shooting sports in the outdoors and also firearms and subsequent legislation. Absolutely. Um, you know, like a lot of Americans, I think I came to hunting as an adult and I kind of went kind of went backwards from the traditional uh, uh, aspect of, well, you start out hunting and then maybe you get a, a handgun for self-defense and, and you go that route. I actually was a handgun owner first. Um, I did not grow up in a gun-owning family. I grew up in, in a very gun-friendly state. I grew up in Oklahoma, but my mom was a single mom, didn't own any guns. Uh, I had uncles on my mom's side who were hunters. They were ranchers and farmers, but uh, they lived outside of the state of Oklahoma, so I rarely saw them. It just really wasn't something that I was exposed to growing up. Um, wasn't anti-hunting by any means, but I never had anybody take me out you know, into the field and, and introduce me to hunting. So mm -hmm. I actually became a, a handgun owner first, uh, buying a firearm for self-defense, and then it was as an adult – uh, that I actually got into hunting. And a lot of it was actually hosting Cam and Company and getting a chance to to talk with hunters and, and asking, finding the courage to actually ask, you know, I've never done this before. Could I go with you? Could I, could I do these things? Could you show me? Um, because, you know, as a grown up, I think there is this, there's almost this invisible barrier that we put between ourselves and others who have experiences that, that we haven't had to have the opportunity to have. And sometimes we don't want to, you know, gosh, am I going to be a bother? Am I going to put myself out there? And they're going to say no. Um, I, I think we've got to get over that fear. If we've got right. that curiosity, we've got that desire to go out and hunt, uh, go out and fish, go out and get into the outdoors, go and ask somebody who does this. I guarantee you nine times out of 10, they're going to be thrilled for the opportunity to share something that they love with somebody else. That is so true. And like you, I got my first exposure into the blast part of the cast and blast movement uh, later in life. I mean, I'm still young, but it was 19 years old when I picked up my first farm. And then I just most recently got into hunting. So I feel like a lot of people kind of go our path uh, to discover the other element. And I think there's actually an effort now to get uh, more young professionals and even adults back into hunting or for the first time into hunting too. So I think it's not uncommon to see people later in life take up hunting. Uh, so that's interesting. You also have that experience too. I didn't think that. I thought more so it was ingrained in you. But, but it's, I feel like it is common because it's, it's a pretty expensive sport on the surface when you think of it and you don't do your research. You feel like, oh gosh, there are so many barriers to entry. There are not enough opportunities. No mm -hmm. one can show me. I felt the same way when I grew up in California. I didn't know people go hunting in California, honestly. <laughs> well, and, 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 right. And that's the thing. And now you know. I mean, yeah. now that you know, you know that there are a lot of hunters and there yes. are a lot of great hunting opportunities out there. But until you start exploring that, and you're right, you see all of these barriers like, okay, well, where do I go and hunt? I don't know anybody who has, you know, private land. I don't know where the hunting, the, the public hunting land is. I don't know, you know, who to take me. There are all of those things that are just sort of intrinsic barriers, right? Mm -hmm. It's just human nature to, mm -hmm. to, to think these things. Um, but it's up to us as gun owners and it's up to us as conservationists to, to help remove those barriers to entry for others and, and to be good ambassadors for the shooting sports. And you're right. I think that this is becoming more and more common, you know, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, most people who were gun owners, I think, got into owning firearms because of hunting, because of the outdoors, because mm -hmm. of competitive shooting. Uh, and now there is a, a sea change. Most people who are becoming gun owners are becoming gun owners for the purposes of self-defense, right? They want to be able to protect themselves and others. Yes. And so now we've got to show them all of the other things uh, that are that are involved and that are a part of the world of uh, gun ownership. Yes. You know, not everybody's going to want to try hunting. No. But I, I think there are a lot of people who – once they realize that, oh, I can do this, oh, this is something that's available to me, they absolutely will get involved. Yeah, and especially when they realize that the excise taxes they pay onto the goods and that 11% that's collected overall goes back to conservation funding for hunting and then there's a fishing equivalent whenever they buy uh, fishing tackle and licenses, the Dingle Johnson Amendment or the Pittman Robertson for hunting. Uh, I think people will will realize that and we have a little bit to do in terms of hunting. I think personal defense has started to, people have started to come around to it. And I think I saw something from the 
United States Concealed Carry Association that a lot of their membership, 40%, is Democrat, which I was surprised to see. I mean, I'm not surprised to see that, but it was interesting that a lot of them self-identify as people who you wouldn't necessarily think are gun owners, especially given the political atmosphere today. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Listen, I think there are a lot of... Uh quiet Democrats yeah. who are who are gun owners out there yes. right now. And they, they, they know the hostility within their party yes. to uh, the Second Amendment. So they just kind of, you know, they keep quiet about it. Um, and, and I know you and I have talked about this before as well, Gabby. You know, our right to keep and bear arms, it's not a right of Republicans. Uh, no, it's, it's not a right, right of the right. It's a right of all Americans. And, and mm-hmm. frankly, it's a right that is going to be much more secure uh, when it is a bipartisan or a nonpartisan issue. So I, I, I look forward to the day. Uh, when it is not a part of the uh, Democrat Party litmus test right. to to support you know all kinds of gun control laws, I think we'll 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 all be better off. But uh, some of that pressure is going to have to come from those Democrats in, inside the party who are gun owners who say, hey, you know what, you're not reflecting a a, a large portion of uh, of your base mm-hmm. here by being so anti gun. You can couch it in terms of gun safety or gun sense, but the mm-hmm. policies that they're still promoting at the end of the day, are, are still the same anti-gun, gun control policies right. that they've been pushing for decades. Right. Yeah, and I, I think in our state, it's a very different paradigm and dichotomy between people who vote a certain way. Like, obviously, Republicans are tend to be gun owners in our state, but you even find uh, Democrats in Virginia and a little bit in the South, too, who still hold that and don't necessarily follow party leadership. Um, and I, I know you've interviewed some people who are Democrats and self, self-avowed or uh, gun owners, too. So they do exist, and I wish we could highlight them more, but it's kind of hard sometimes with, <laughs> with, with all the news cycle and the stories that come up front. But, no, I think we have to include them, too. And I think they do, a lot of them do secretly agree that if you infringe or take away certain elements of firearms rights, it's going to disenfranchise people who may historically have been disadvantaged, too. I think people don't see that that's what could happen uh, if they were to remove certain things. And there's some story now, you may be covering this on your um, show, but some woman had like a marijuana conviction and she's pregnant and she self defended herself against uh, an intruder in her house in Arkansas. And so they're Mm -hmm. debating whether or not uh, the criminal conviction she had, I don't know if it was for mere possession or whatnot, but I feel like we're going to have to be debating these very uh, nuanced types of stories very soon. So <laughs> it's interesting yeah, that that's going to take a hold in the gun debate, too. Absolutely. Yeah, I believe in that uh, situation, she actually picked up her husband's firearm. Yes, that's right. Uh, so he was legally allowed to own it, but she was not legally allowed to possess it because of her marijuana conviction. Right. And, and there could have been some prosecutorial discretion. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, now the prosecutors have actually taken this forward. I'm actually hoping that a, a jury will look at this and say, so the options were she could pick up the gun and defend herself mm-hmm. um, and, and then face a felony charge for being in illegal possession of a firearm. Or she could not pick up the firearm and defend herself, and then she could be dead. Well, if those are your two choices, you know, I don't think we should punish somebody for acting in self-defense. Yeah, that's what I'd, I'd like to see happen. I don't know if that's yeah. what will happen, but that's what I'd like to see happen if I were on the jury. Yeah, and I, I know that some of our opponents say that we don't care about people in these circumstances, and I think all of us do want to see kind of uh, those who do take up self-defense measures, even if they have like some instances that's not clear in their background, and it's a little dicey thing, but I think, yeah, we should be a little bit better because they accuse us like, oh, we don't support people who... Uh, let's say like the Philando Castile case, which I think a lot of gun owners, myself included, were kind of like, what's going on here? And I think um, we do have to take a better stance on that. And I think, I hope the NRA will too, and in other gun groups as well. But I think, yeah, we're going to have to become more comfortable with those conversations and do defend the rights of people who may feel or may be presumed to be dis- disenfranchised. So that's going to be interesting too. <laughs> to Absolutely. Well. Yeah. So Cam, talk a little bit about how you got into media, especially with NRA TV, was there a specific path you chose uh, to get to where you are or did just kind of come spur of the moment? Kind of illuminate what happened in your in your journey to become a host. Sure. Um, it was a long and winding road um, that started out in Arkansas. I was a master control operator at a, a TV station, which sounds like a very important job, <laughs> uh, but it's the guy that pushes the button that makes the commercials play. Uh, and it is as entry level a job in television as you can get. But that was my first job, 
And from there, I actually started on the production side. I was a videographer. I was a director. Um, and uh, I did production, uh, helped, you know, uh, make commercials for a couple of years, decided I want to get into the news side of things. Uh, so I moved to Oklahoma city, started out at the bottom, you know, uh, a rung on the ladder in a, uh, a news station in Oklahoma city, did that for a couple of years, uh, produced some health segments, kind of got, uh, you know, I, I got the reporting bug, but I realized that I had a face for radio. So there was oh. not really going to be much of a future in TV reporting for me. So I made the transition over into radio as a radio reporter, um, ultimately was asked to become a, a radio host and and liked the transition, um, produced documentaries, kind of floated around, you know, for probably a, a 10 years or so, a little bit longer in, uh, in, in media. Um, and then found out that, you know, the NRA was was launching NRA TV. They had um, a product called NRA Live that had been going on and was really groundbreaking in terms of live streaming video on the Internet back in the early 2000s uh, and, and the late 1990s. I mean, this was really cutting edge stuff. And so NRA News was going to be sort of the next iteration uh, of NRA Live. Uh, and they asked if I would like to be a part of it. And I absolutely jumped to the chance. I thought this was going to be uh, an incredible opportunity to uh, to delve deeply into an issue that, that I cared about and and I knew that millions of Americans cared about um, to actually kind of, you know, narrow cast and, and cover just the Second Amendment. I was a, for a long time, I was a general assignment reporter. So I covered uh, cops and courts. So every day it was going down to the Oklahoma City Police Department, going down to the courthouse, the federal courthouse. I covered school board meetings. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the house fires and the uh, the random crimes. Um, and every day I, I didn't really know what it was that I was going to be expected to report knowledgeably on. And it was the idea of being able to focus on an issue that I cared about and to really offer up something that that wasn't available uh, at that point in time, a three hour a day show that focused almost exclusively on second amendment news and issues. Mm-hmm. It was just, it was just a really appealing thing for me. And it's been 14 years and I still love oh coming to work gosh. every day. That's incredible. And yeah, I've had, I mean, ever every time I go on your program, I have a lot of friends say like, Oh my gosh, that was so cool. And, and a lot of people like, not just because of me, but I feel like you bring on such a wide swath of guests, like luminaries in the second amendment world activists, advocates, journalists, and everyone. So you've built up a very good name for yourself. So you should be very proud. (laughs) Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. No, I feel like a lot of people come back to me and they said, I heard you on Cam and Company. It was so great. You shared your perspective. And I know other guests who've who've gone on to mutual friends of ours or mutual acquaintances, I should say, have said the same thing that they always enjoy it. And people just love your friendly disposition (laughs) and your attitude to the issues. Well, the name of the show is Cam and Company yeah. for a reason. And I've always said, you know, if I'm the smartest person that people hear on a show every day, I, I failed because I want to become smarter over the course of the, the three hours. And so it's it's not about me, you know, spending three hours talking about how smart I am and how awesome I am. It's, okay, what, what are we going to learn today, right, uh, so that we can all be better prepared, we can all be better voters, we can all be better activists, uh, and, and, and frankly – you know, I'm, I'm glad that you talked about sort of the the breadth and the depth of the uh, types of guests that we have in the program. I just want to try to reflect what modern gun ownership looks like in the country. Right. And in order to do that, you're going to have a lot of really different people from a lot of different sure. backgrounds on the show. And that's one of the cool things about going to an NRA annual meeting or going to the range uh, or going to your local gun store or listening to Cam Company. You, you, you do start to realize – just how broad a movement this really is. Yeah, it's not just your old gray beard white guy who's a gun owner. It's a lot of women, people who are not white, people who may be first generation or fresh off the boat from a different country, people who fled communism, socialism, people who grew up poor and then countered that and succeeded. So it's a lot, people from a lot of different socioeconomic backgrounds and dispositions and political affiliations, too, who are gun owners. And I think you are certainly doing a very good job of trying to highlight that and bring on people who encompass those different values and differences, although they have the same goal of promoting the Second Amendment and the preservation of it. 
Absolutely. I, I do just have to uh, take a moment to give a shout out to my producer, uh, Cameron Gray, yes. uh, and our executive producer, John Pop, uh, and uh, the great staff that we've got, uh, Kyle Morgan and uh, Katie and Justin and Ashley, um, all of whom, you know, really help, I think, make the show what it is. I'm just a, a small part of a really, really great team. Yeah, you do. And it, it has been fun going in studio. I remember, I think, uh, the first appearance I had on your program, you weren't in the office, but it was Cameron Gray and my dad and me, and we went on <laughs> <laughs> to talk about stuff. It was, goodness, fall 2012, and I think my dad highlighted what gun control looked like in the Soviet Union, and it was a lot of fun. And then from there, we did that most recent interview together where my dad finally met you earlier this year at the Great American Outdoor Show in Pennsylvania, so it's so fun to see everything come full circle, too, like you do in studio, remote, and then in the field with conferences, too. So it's a lot of fun. And your team is great. I can't say anything but wonderful things about your team. They're, they're wonderful folks. Well, I will let them know that. Thank you. <laughs> of course. The next question I want to ask you, something we have kind of debated offline, uh, kind of this uh, anti-gun, gun control view that kind of seeps into hunting. So we've seen people like a, a West Siler out of Outside Magazine and some others across the dailies in the country that say that hunters uh, are misrepresented by the NRA. The NRA doesn't really stand for hunting. Uh, they're polluting and diluting what it means to go hunting. And then they insert like Bernie Sanders type rhetoric or very far left rhetoric to hunting. And obviously we don't have to have a conservative view of hunting. Although I would say most people, it's a kind of conservative tradition, although it, it extends to people who are not conservative too. But what do you say to people who say that you have to be anti-gun to be a true hunter? Like what those, um, like those who say such in Outside Magazine or, or more prominent magazines? Because we see this and it's pretty divisive uh, having both my toes in, in both worlds now. I see that and a lot of people come to me and say, why is this happening? Why are they trying to divide the hunting circle or hunting community with this rhetoric? So what are your thoughts on that? Oh, do you have like four hours? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, that's, <laughs> and there, there, there is a lot to unpack because this right. is something that has certainly been going on uh, e even longer than I've been uh, involved in the issue on a daily basis. You know, you've, you've had the fight between, uh, the FUDs, which is, you know, sort of what the, the non-hunting gun owners tend to call the uh, the older hunters. And a lot of it is older hunters. Right. Um, they're, 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 I think there is sort of a, a generation gap involved where you may have right. older hunters who say, I don't, I never hunted with an AR-15. I don't think you need an AR-15 to hunt versus people who've grown up with the AR-15 as, as their standard rifle who say, well, yeah. no, this, this makes a great hunting rifle. Why would I want anything else? Because this works for me. Uh, you know, we need to not let, uh, first of all, you know, our, our personal preferences uh, get in the way of policy advancements, mm -hmm. right? And and so part of what we need to do is to just, you know, learn to, um, uh, to, 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 to be able to get along and to not try to force our own decisions onto others. We, 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 right. know, we know that we are more successful when we can focus on the bigger, broader issues. Yes. And we can have differences of opinion. Uh, underneath that sort of umbrella right. of, of unity, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and if we don't do that, if we don't unify on those big issues, what we're going to find is we get picked apart one tiny issue at a time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I see uh, the hunters or, you know, outside magazine, that guy, uh, uh, Wes, who wrote about the NRA, and, uh, you know, his issue seemed to be that uh, he doesn't think the NRA is fighting hard enough for public access right. uh, to, right. to hunting lands. But here, here's the here's the corollary here. So um, you look at what would have happened had Hillary Clinton gotten into office. Right. Well, we would have seen more moves like what we saw under the Obama administration to remove uh, a wildlife uh, refuge uh, protections uh, uh, from the state level, put them under federal control. Yep. Uh, you know, the, the, if you have a, a more broadly anti-hunting agenda coming out of, from the uh, of an administration, mm -hmm. um then, you know, they may not do anything uh, adversely regarding access, but they're going to do a lot of other adverse actions regarding your ability to hunt, regarding the ability yes. to bring people into the field, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so we can't let, you know, perfect be the enemy of good either. Uh, there are going to be some difficult uh, considerations, but I got to tell you, I mean, every conversation that I've had uh, with folks at the NRA, with Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke, mm -hmm. um, access is, is, is a key issue. And, and it's a key issue to everybody. So, again, I don't think we should let 
uh, you know, the disagreements over, well, how best do we achieve those, those goals right. stand in the way of us actually working together. You know, I, I I'm kind of like, I like to think about, maybe it's just because I grew up in Oklahoma, but Will Rogers has always been one of my heroes and Will Rogers, you know, famously said, I never met a man I didn't like. Well, I, I've never met a gun owner that I didn't like. I've never met a gun owner that I couldn't work with mm-hmm. as long as they're willing to work with me. Right. Right. And, and, and if we, and again, if we don't, we don't share that attitude, we are going to see our rights diminished. We're going to see our rights to keep and bear arms diminished. We're going to right. see our rights to hunting diminished. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're all going to suffer as a result of that. And I would hate to see hubris and, and ego and, you know, all, all of these very fallible human emotions stand in the way of us actually strengthening and securing our ability to take to the field. Yeah, it's very true. And I think the Secretary of the interior gets a lot of flack for no reason. And granted, nobody is perfect, but I've actually been pretty satisfied with his work to improve access, expand access on the National Wildlife Refuges, for example. And I believe his department just released a memo to empower the state wildlife agencies over federal uh, laws and dictates and decrees to make it easier so hunters and anglers don't get confused as to how they can hunt or access or things of that sort. I have to read a little more in detail. I'm not sure specifically what those rules will be, but I I feel like it would empower the simple hunter and angler to pursue their activities without maybe perhaps buying extraneous stuff, paying all these ridiculous fees, not knowing their rights, not knowing this. So it's a very good step. And we haven't had an administration in my lifetime, I can't recall any other interior secretary who prioritizes safe and responsible firearms use for shooting sports month, which just happened back in August. I don't remember anyone doing that. I think, sadly, Joel, his predecessor, was very anti-gun. I think there was an interview that Benny Johnson did with the secretary uh, last year where they talked with Interior Police or National Park Service Police who said, yeah, our uh, Zinke's like, predecessor was very anti-gun, and they were very relieved that someone like him is now at the helms of the agency. And they always call him an extractionist. He's going to sell off all public lands. And I think people don't understand what multi-use really means it doesn't mean you have to explore everything extract everything but that doesn't mean you have to restrict it either if it can be safely done uh without impeding on people's rights to go to the outdoors and the whole monuments debate was a complete embarrassment from those from the other side like the patagonia rei types where they said that zinke and trump stole people's land although blm had greater control and rest over let's say the uh, bear's ears National Monument, uh, and I think shrinking it, it, it was the right move to do. So there is that divide, obviously, between hunters and sometimes the gunners that happen. But I agree. I think we have to be stronger in numbers. And look what we see when, when certain administrations that don't like hunting and have that certain political disposition in New Jersey, for example, mm-hmm. when they're in power, they take away the right to hunt, much like they do take away the right or further restrict the right to keep and bear arms. And people have to remember that hunting is not a right guaranteed under the Second Amendment, although tools used in both activities, they help fund conservation efforts through the Pittman-Robertson Fund. So anytime anyone purchases a firearm, as you very well know, uh, a portion of that goes back to the Department of Interior to later distribute to the State Wildlife Agency. So with our purchases, we're actually helping fund conservation. It sounds counterintuitive, but that's just the system that's in place, and it really does say a lot about people in our sector uh, who are very gracious and care much about the resources that they pursue or the animals that they harvest. Um, They don't want every animal to be taken away. (laughs) They don't want their their rights to be removed in the process too. So yeah, it's going to be a challenge to, to try to marry those interests. And I've had a lot of people tell me, what is the NRA going to do to better promote hunter interests? And I know having spoken with Grant and some of the others, there is an interest to pursue and to actively be vocal about hunting rights too and i know with all the legal bit issues we've been dealing with with people trying to take away second amendment rights or putting in universal background checks magazine bans and the like uh people feel like hunting has been neglected but you you believe that they're going to take a key, more keen interest in trying to promote hunting alongside uh, second amendment rights I, I do. I mean, yeah. uh, NRA hunting is, you know, a part of that organization. Yes. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things that I've noticed uh, over uh, the 14 years or so that I've been doing that camera company is that sometimes there is this attitude among gun owners of, well, what's the NRA going to do? 
Well, the fact of the matter is, you know, we are the NRA, right? There are six million of us. And so there are things that the organization can do at the, you know, 30,000 foot level. But more importantly, there are also things that we NRA members can do on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. And, and, and in fact, we have to. Because we can't expect that, you know, uh, the, the folks that work in uh, headquarters in Fairfax are going to be able to uh, affect cultural change all mm-hmm. by themselves. Oh, no, they yeah. can't. Yeah. Right. I mean, we've got to get involved and we've got to be able to tell our stories. And that's one of the ways that I think the NRA as an as an organization can help is that they can help tell those stories Absolutely. of their members about why hunting is so important to them. You know, we are, I think, becoming increasingly removed from our food supply. Right. And and so I, I think that there's a greater and greater disconnect between people who go to the store and they pick up the boneless chicken breast or they pick up the uh, you know pork shoulder or, or they'll pick up the beef ribs uh, and they don't think this was alive. Right. This was an animal at one point in time. And so they feel horrified when they see somebody go out and, and hunt or they hear somebody say, oh, yeah, you know, you want to try some of my backstrap? What's that? Oh, that's venison. That's from the deer that I got last week. They're they're absolutely horrified by yeah. this. And they think, my God, hunters, hunters must be monsters. <laughs> I, you know, I, I we said earlier, you know, I grew up in the suburbs of Oklahoma City. I did not hunt as a kid. Um, but having lived on a small farm for almost six years now and, and really just kind of Coming into this blind, mm-hmm. I can tell you that I've got a much better appreciation for all of the food that I eat, uh, having that closer relationship to the food that's on my plate, whether it is food that I have gone out and I have hunted, whether it is, uh, you know, food that I have actually raised. Yeah, on your um, farm. You know, but to but to, to have that connection with your food, I think, I, 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 I personally believe that it is a very important part of being human. And I think mm-hmm. that this is actually something that we as hunters need to be talking more about. Right. That connection to nature, that connection to the environment, mm-hmm. and that connection, again, to the food that we're putting in our bodies. Mm-hmm. This is something that I think uh, maybe we may be able to make some inroads with folks uh, by, by talking about not just the, the health benefits, but the, the emotional and the spiritual benefits to, to hunting. Yeah, and there are a lot. And I think... A lot of people who are kind of in the middle are very persuadable uh, for that. It's going to be hard to get like the PETA types. Maybe there may be a few vegans in the process who will be open-minded. But it's going to be challenging because social media, as you've seen with uh, two attacks on one of them being Eva Shockey's husband when he harvested the grizzly bear legally in the Mm -hmm. Yukon. And then the probably perhaps more controversial one, although for those of us who understand manage big game hunts, and, and their purpose, the lady who harvested the leopard in Africa, I think a lot of people see that and then they just get angry and they don't know what happens in the process and why limited but managed hunts like that exist and what that does for economies, let's say in Canada, for Tim Brent or uh, for the lady uh, who harvested the leopard in Africa and how much it benefits the locals there and how much they're grateful to Westerners and Europeans to come go hunt to help maybe take care of a nuisance animal or something like that. So even for the more controversial types of big game hunting like that, I think it's very important that we do educate people even from that angle too. Absolutely. Absolutely. In addition to the, the learning about the organic qualities to it, being closer with nature, finding enjoyment out of it. Cause even if you don't harvest an animal, you're learning something and you're being one with nature, you're getting away from TV and social media, and you're learning lessons, building camaraderie with the people you go hunting with, and just seeing that dynamic, that what made America, America today, because that's what our forebearers did, and it's something that's making a comeback, and people want to be able to do that, because they have the right to do it in this country, unlike other countries, like more socialist countries do not allow you to go hunting, as we know. <laughs> right. I remember having that conversation with your dad about what yeah. it was like to, uh, to try to hunt and fish uh, in the yeah. Soviet Union. And uh, absolutely. And, 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 you know, again, it's up to us to actually make the effort and to do this. We can't expect that there's going to be some, you know, government agency or some other, right. you know, group of people out there. This is, this is, and this is not going to be something that changes overnight, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, you know, we, we're talking about processes that have been occurring just in our society mm-hmm. Uh, over decades, as as more and more of us have become uh, uh, more and more acidified, uh, mm-hmm. right, and we've kind of lost that connection with nature, or we find that connection with nature in a uh, a city park uh, mm-hmm. or or someplace like that, um, th- we're going to have to commit to this being a long term, I think, recentering 
of, of, of where we are in this country and, and to not ignore those open spaces out there where, again, there's, 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 there's so much joy to be found. It's very true. And on the East Coast, we we have some challenges with access, not like anything bad, but we're more of a private land type of access environment. And I know out West, it's a lot more public based. So I think figuring out how we navigate those changes and there are organizations out there and private companies that are doing that. And actually one exists in Virginia, uh, Outdoor Access, you may be familiar with them. So I think even with challenges like that, there are ways to navigate those challenges and find connection back to the land and, and the environment. Even if you're within an hour of a city, I think those opportunities are very possible. I try my best to find those opportunities and I have within an hour and a half driving distance in Virginia or Maryland to go fishing or hunting. And that does exist. And I think, yeah, if you're able to lead the charge and like if all of us put our minds together, I think we can get more people. I can try to get, do my best to get more millennials and we can get more adults and people who may have fallen out of hunting to realize there are opportunities around us to, to pursue these activities. Uh, absolutely right. And, and, you know, again, it's just something that uh, we've got to decide we want to do every day. There are going to be distractions right. uh, and, and things that, you know, try to waylay us from, from this agenda. But when we, when we have those opportunities, um, we really do need to take advantage of them because we know that there are those groups each and every day uh, that are out there working to to try to you know make it impossible for you to continue right. to hunt and and again they've got some uh, I think they've got some uh, uh, cultural indicators on their side you're right yeah. you know, we've got our work cut out for us so we can't take any of this for granted absolutely I wholeheartedly agree so Cam where can everyone connect with you find out what you're up to are you going to be doing 40 acre full going forward and how is how is Mrs E doing Yes. So, okay. A lot to, uh, a yep. lot to address there. Um, so, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, uh, easiest way to find me uh, on Twitter at Cam Edwards. Uh, Cam and Company is NRA TV. Uh, we are live 2 to 5 Eastern each and every weekday. You can get us on demand at NRATV.com as well. Uh, also on uh, Amazon, Apple TV, Roku, iTunes. If you want just the audio, iHeartRadio. Uh, the 40 Acre Fool podcast is. Coming back for at least a couple more episodes. This is something Excellent. we've been doing for a few years um, since we moved to the farm. I'm the, I'm the fool on the 40 acres, and my wife, Miss E, uh, has been going through a chemotherapy. She got diagnosed with lung cancer a couple of years ago, and uh, we've been uh, fighting this ever since. So she just started a new round of chemotherapy, and uh, hopefully when she's feeling better, we'll be able to record a couple of episodes. So I'm, I'm not quite sure what the long-term future is for 40 acres and a fool. There may be a, a retweaked and uh, renamed podcast that has a slightly different focus, uh, in the future. But, um, but, but there are at least a couple more episodes of 40 acres and a fool coming. That's really great to hear. And no, uh, your wife is in my thoughts and prayers and I hope I have no doubt she'll do her best to kick cancer to the curb. Because I know how much you've been dealing with that, and it just breaks my heart to see that. But I think I'm hoping, and I'll keep her in my thoughts and prayers, that she kicks it and does well. Well, thank you. Yeah, no, of Thanks. course. Yeah, Cam, I'm so grateful you came on and we chatted about this. And I know every time we finish an interview, whenever I come on NRA TV, we always talk about going fishing. I hope we make that a reality to go in your corner of the state near the James River. So we'll follow up about that. And I appreciate you, and I wish you good luck with. NRA TV and anything else you have your way and so so appreciate you coming on and telling your story on Oh absolutely and, and and thank you again for the invitation. I just think this is such a uh, fantastic idea for a podcast and I wish you all of the best with the uh, district you, of conservation friend. going forward. Thank you my friend. I really appreciate it. What did you guys think of our interview with Cam Edwards, host of NRA TV's Cam and Company? Did you like it? Do you want to see more Guests like Cam come on District of Conservation. Let me know. We have some awesome people lined up in the coming episodes, and I'll be sure to bring them to you. We're going to talk to a lot of people across the conservation outdoor space here in the D.C. metro area and the surrounding states. Plus, I'll be bringing in people who don't necessarily live in our region but come here, work here, and deal with the federal government, let's say the Department of Interior, Fish and Wildlife Service, and talk with them too. So if you want to leave us a review... We would be very grateful for that. You can review us on iTunes, Google Play, and other podcast hosting portals. Make sure you're subscribed to District of Conservation. You can find all of the participating partner portals at anchor.fm. I encourage you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, where we're going to announce future guests and exciting things happening there. So 
it's going to be fun and I hope you guys are enjoying the series and following us and providing your feedback. We're going to have more interviews coming up and make sure you stay tuned for episode five next week. Thank you.